What's up everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. Alright, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. So for this case, we have a 74-year-old woman with a past medical history of hypertension and a previous myocardial infarction that was treated with stenting and now she's admitted to the hospital for heart failure exacerbation. So we have an elderly woman, significant cardiac history, and now she has, she's in heart failure. You know, having a previous MI is often a common cause for heart failure. It's called ischemic cardiomyopathy, just meaning that the heart underwent ischemia and now that it doesn't pump as efficiently. So this is very common to see. So she demonstrated improvement though after being admitted during the first two days with diuretic therapy. So it's pretty typical, she comes in, she's a demitus, she has trouble breathing, and she gets diuretic therapy, and she pees off all that extra fluid, and then she starts to feel better. And so that's pretty typical for our heart failure patients. However, on day three of the admission, she suddenly develops shortness of breath, and her oxygen saturation decreases from 98 to 84% on room air. So patients in the hospital, unfortunately, they can become at risk for certain things for happen certain things happening. For example, you can have a pulmonary embolism. So patients in the hospital, especially elderly patients, they're not getting up and moving around as much as they should. They puts them at risk for developing DVTs in the legs, and those can embolize. This is why patients in the hospital are often put on prophylactic anticoagulation. The other thing patients are at risk for is aspiration. So essentially material going down the wrong tube. So instead of going down the esophagus, it goes down the trachea and into the bronchial tree, obstructing part of the airway. Very common in hospitalized patients, especially elderly patients, also common in patients that have an altered mental status or that are alcoholics or that are impaired in some way. Stroke patients, unfortunately, it's very common. And this can certainly cause hypoxia as well. The other thing is patients can develop pneumonia, so they can get effect infections. Unfortunately, in the hospital, you're also at risk for exposure to bacteria and viruses and, and are definitely at risk for potentially developing a pneumonia as well. So reading on here, you got to look at the vitals. So her temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, so she's afebrile. So infection certainly still could be possible, but you know you would expect maybe to see a fever at this point. Heart rate's 101, so she's a little bit tachycardic. Respiration rate is 25. It's definitely elevated, but not crazy off the charts. Blood pressure 152 over 88. It's elevated, but it's not you know it's not like it's 200 over 100 or anything like that. You know she is a hypertensive. So the vitals haven't helped us out too much here. Bottom line is she's stable. You know it's not this isn't someone needing to rush to the ICU. So you get a chest X-ray very reasonable thing to do in this scenario, and it shows you a right lower lobe infiltrate. So you see something in the right lower lobe, that should key you off. Usually you don't see anything for PE on x-ray. Definitely would key you off to an aspiration, also could be a pneumonia. So you get a chest CT to further evaluate this. And what does it demonstrate? It demonstrates mucus plugging. So she aspirated. A bunch of mucus, it went down into the trachea, and you see it in the right lower lobe bronchus. So the part of the bronchial tree supplying the right lower lobe of the right lung is plugged up with mucus. And then you also see right lower lobe ground glass opacities consistent with acute aspiration pneumonitis. So this is basically radiology jargon for ground glass opacities just is representative of usually edema or some type of material in the lung tissue. So you plug up the airway, you're going to get inflammation, you're going to get edema, and that's what you're seeing here. And so pneumonitis is just inflammation of the airway. So what they're asking here is, will you see an increase or a decrease in the following physiological parameters? And so again, this is similar to one of the previous Da Vinci cases in the respiratory unit. The respiratory physiology questions definitely like to ask these with the change in arrows because you know, you're changing these parameters in response to certain pathophysiology. So if we kind of sum everything up, we've got an elderly woman with significant cardiac history admitted for heart failure exacerbation. She was improving, but now she's developed acute shortness of breath and decreased oxygen saturation secondary to an aspiration. So it's asking you if during an aspiration, and more so specifically an airway or a bronchial airway blockage, will you see an increase or a decrease in these parameters? So a VQ ratio or the ventilation perfusion ratio, RLL is right lower lobe, so the right lower lobe alveolar PO2 or partial pressure of oxygen, the right lower lobe perfusion, 
the AA gradient, meaning the alveolar arterial gradient. We'll talk more about that in a second. And then the arterial partial pressure of oxygen. So again, this is just an anatomical diagram to show you what's going on here. So you have the trachea, you have the right and left main bronchus. On the left, you only have two lobes. These just represent the zones for, perf for perfusion and ventilation. Same thing here. Even though there's only two lobes, there's still three zones. Same thing over here. You have three lobes and you have a bronchus to each of the lobes. And you see an aspiration here going to a blockage, blocking the bronchus going to the right lower lobe. So we went over a similar type diagram in one of the previous Da Vinci cases. We were talking about diffusion versus perfusion limited gas exchange, and you can definitely check that out in the previous video. But here, just to review this real quickly, you know, you have an alveolus here, you have your normal partial pressure of oxygen at about 100 millimeters of mercury, you have oxygen very readily diffusing into this capillary blood, this pulmonary capillary blood comes in. Remember, you have mixed venous blood here. So this is venous blood. So you're gonna have a lower oxygen partial pressure of oxygen here, it's gonna be 40. You pick up a bunch of oxygen, you dump off a bunch of CO2, PaO2 ju jumps to about 100. The VQ, the normal VQ ratio for a lung, if you know, a healthy, young, non-smoker is about 0.8. So that's a good number to keep in mind. And then the AA gradient or alveolar arterial gradient is a good way to differentiate different causes of hypoxemia. So here, this is the partial pressure of alveolar oxygen minus the partial pressure of arterial oxygen. So as you can see here in normal individuals, it's roughly zero, but you'll see in a lot of textbooks where it'll say about five to 10. So maybe here you get to about 95. So 100 minus 95 is five. So you wanna think about five to 10. When it gets larger than that, then you wanna be thinking about different things that'll cause hypoxemia. And so we'll talk about a few causes of that here in a second. All right, guys, we're gonna take a quick break from the case right now to let you know that DaVinci Cases is brought to you by DaVinci Academy which provides online video courses for the medical basic sciences. These courses are taught using a variety of teaching methods, including bullet point outlines, diagrams, radiology images, and chalk talks to explain the fundamental concepts. We then teach the application of those concepts to numerous clinical pearls that are frequently tested on medical school exams and the USMLE. Our video courses are available on our website, dviacademy.com, as monthly subscriptions starting at $9.99 per month. Each video course has a corresponding outline format textbook as well. You can find the link to our website in the description below. Also be sure to use the discount code DC20 to receive 20% off any of our video courses. Now back to the case. So first let's run through airway obstruction. So how that changes our diagram here. So you have your airway here. This is what's happened in our patient. You have this blockage of the airway. Oxygen can't get in. So it's gonna go, the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen is gonna to go to zero. And it's in the right lower lobe, you're blocking off the entire lobe. So if we come down here, this is each of the parameters down here in this table. So the alveolar PO2, right away you can fill this in. It's gonna go, it's gonna drop because it's gonna to go to zero. You know, normal's 100, it's going to zero. You look at the VQ, this is pretty easy. Your ventilation's gonna be zero. I mean, you're not getting any air in here. It's totally blocked. So it's gonna to go to zero. And remember, normal is 0 0.8. So you're gonna decrease the VQ ratio. So what you've created here is you have an alveolus here or a, you know, an alveolar entire lobe in this, in this particular patient that's not getting any oxygen, not getting any air. So what you've created here is an intrapulmonary shunt. So shunts in the scenario of respiratory physiology, you either have intrapulmonary or cardiac shunts. Cardiac shunts are in patients that have essentially holes in their in their chambers, so either ventricular septal defects or atrial septal defects. There's a few normal shunts, but we'll, uh, we won't talk about those here. Essentially where you're moving blood from the right side of the heart via VSD or ASD to the left side and not sending that to the lungs, not getting oxygen. Essentially moving blood to the left side of the heart without it getting oxygen. That's what a shunt is in this scenario. Intrapulmonary just means it's in the lungs. You have a part of the lung that is not getting ventilated and you're moving blood by it. So blood is traveling here. Remember our mixed venous is about 40 millimeters of mercury is our partial pressure of oxygen. There's no oxygen to pick up, so it's gonna stay about the same. And so as a result of that, our arterial PO2 is going to be decreased. And then as a result of this, one thing I wanna explain, so you wanna think about the perfusion. So what happens is, is the body has is very smart in this scenario. It knows, it, it, it physiologically figures out that it is not getting oxygen or ventilation here. So it actually cuts off blood supply, not entirely, 
but it limits the blood supply. And so the way it does that is, so if we show you this diagram here and you have a cross section of your pulmonary artery, so it's essentially if you cut a slice through here. So this is a cross section here. This is a longitudinal view. This is a cross sectional view. So you've got oxygen in normal, normal scenario here, 100 millimeters of mercury. Oxygen actually comes down and stimulates dilation of vascular smooth muscles. So you want to keep this vessel open, get as much blood flow in as possible, as much oxygenation as possible. However, what happens is, is if you block that airway, like we've done here, your alveolar partial pressure of oxygen drops to zero. You have no oxygen to come down and dilate this vessel. So then what happens is, is that the vessel, as a response to that, vasoconstricts. So pulmonary tissue is the opposite of peripheral tissue. Peripheral tissues, you have low oxygen, the blood vessels are going to dilate because you want to get blood flow as fast as possible to that. You want to increase blood flow, increase oxygen delivery. In the lungs, it's the opposite because you're not getting any oxygen. So why waste blood flow to that area? Why not shunt that blood flow to somewhere else where you are getting a lot of oxygen? And that's what the body's doing here. So it's a pretty smart response if you think about it. It's pretty cool. So perfusion, as a result of that, is going to be decreased because you're vasoconstricting. So lastly here to explain the AA gradient, if we come back here and you think about the pulmonary veins, you know, they're all draining here and coming back to the center. So our blockage is here. Our airway obstruction is here in the right lower lobe. But let's say to understand this, your partial pressure in the alveolus of oxygen is zero. And then you get back and it's 40, like we said in the in this particular area, is going to be 40. So you're, well, it's a negative. Well, what you got to remember is this is for, the AA gradients for everything. So here in these areas, these are still getting oxygenated. So you're still having, you know, 100 here, 100 here. 100 here, 100 here. So everything else is getting fully oxygenated. You're getting back. The difference is, is in normal person, this is going to be 100 when you get back here and send it to the heart. The problem is, is that you have an entire lobe that is 40. I mean, 40 is dramatically less than 100. So this is not going to be 100. Let's say it's 80. So if the normal alveolar O2 is 100 and the arterial O2 is supposed to be about 100, then it's going to be roughly zero. However, in our scenario, the arterial oxygen, arterial partial pressure of oxygen is say roughly 80. This is still going to be about 100 because you ventilated enough of the rest of the lungs to get to about 100. It's going to be 20. 20 is a lot larger than zero. So if we come back to this here, our AA gradient is going to be increased. And so that's why. Because it's I, the reason I use that extra diagram is because it's not intuitive. You know, oh, it's zero minus 40. It makes sense. You got to think about it in the global picture. It's 40 coming from this right lower low, but you're still getting 100 from the rest of these. So instead of having 100 total, it's going to be 80s per se. You know, it's, it's going to be something decreased significantly. 80 is much worse than 100. So if we come here to pulmonary embolus, so what happens here is you've blocked blood flow. You're not getting blood flow here and you're not oxygenating it. So arterial right, PO2 right off the bat is going to go, is going to decrease. This goes to zero. So what that's going to cause, you just got to use your math. The VQ is going to go to infinity. So the VQ is going to increase. Infinity is larger than 0 0.8. The alveolar PO2 is actually going to increase because essentially you're not getting blood flow. You're decreasing blood flow in here. So you're not moving oxygen. So it's just going to build up in here. Also, you're, since you're not getting blood flow, you're not kicking out CO2. So the alveolar partial pressure of CO2 is going to be about zero. You're just not getting it in. So your perfusion is obviously decreased because of the clot. And then as a result of this, your AA gradient, well, here, this is pretty simple. You can even just do it here. 150 minus zero is 150. But even if you use our global picture, if we come back here, again, this is going to be, if one of these is zero, that's going to even, even, even be worse in the past than the previous scenario of airway obstruction. So again, you're going to increase the AA gradient in this scenario. So pulmonary embolus versus airway obstruction, the AA gradient gets increased, the arterial PO2 gets decreased, so they're both causes of hypoxemia. Perfusion is decreased in both scenarios, but for very different reasons. In this scenario, it's a clot. In the previous, it's 
that reactive vasoconstriction to low oxygen. The LVO or PO2 in this scenario is increased. Obviously in the previous scenario because of the airway blockage is increased. And then in this scenario it's increased. And then the VQ in the airway obstruction example is decreased. So if we come back to the question, we can actually use, remember that trick I talked about in the one Da Vinci case is how you can actually answer this. So right off the bat, let's just, if we just go left to right, we know the VQ is decreased because we know that VQ equals zero, which is less than 0 0.8, which is the normal. So right off the bat, anything that says it's increased, we can cross off. So we can cross off this and cross off this. So now we've down to C, D, and E. So if we move over here, Let's go with another simple one. If we, if you go with the AA gradient, you know it's increased. So you know that answer C is not answered because it says the AA gradient is decreased. And so then if we move, now it's a, a matter of kind of looking at the rest of these. So if we come back here, right lower lobe alveolar PO2, both of these answer choices is decreased. That doesn't do any good. Right lower lobe perfusion. Okay, so we know, we know kind of in both examples, both pulmonary embolus and airway obstruction, it is decreased, but we know specifically we have that re reaction to hypoxia where we're gonna vasoconstrict and limit our perfusion to that area where the obstruction is. So we know that right low low perfusion is actually decreased. So E cannot be our answer choice. And then if we move down here, remember all of these, both airway obstruction and pulmonary embolus, the arterial PO2 is going to be decreased as a cause of hypoxemia because you're just not oxygenating as well. So our answer choice is D. All right, that's all I have for you this time. Be sure to check out all the Da Vinci Cases videos available on our YouTube channel and our website, dviacademy.com. The PDF notes for every Da Vinci Cases is also available on our website. Also be sure to check out our podcast, The Da Vinci Hour, where we interview attendings and residents across medicine to learn more about their experiences, their specialties, and to get their insights on navigating a career in medicine. You can find the Da Vinci Hour podcast on our website, or any platform where podcasts are found. Lastly, you can find all of our video courses and corresponding outline format books on our website. Don't forget to use the discount code DC20 for 20% off.